I'm talking about Avocado IPM, and I started rethinking the title of this program. I, I, I think there are growers, and I was asked by some growers, do, do I have IPM, or what is IPM? And I, th I think that is a valid question. Um, some people have IPM and don't know it. Some people want IPM and can't get it. And so that's sort of what's going on here is, is uh, a knowledge uh, dissemination of, of what you've got and uh, where you need to go or maybe you already have it and don't know it. So I'm going to cover three avenues today. Uh, first, what is integrated pest management? I'm not going to read to you, but this is the UCIPM definition and it's um, all of the existing tools in your toolbox applied in the decision-making process as you're uh, inspecting your orchard or as your pest control advisor is in inspecting your orchard. So you don't necessarily use every tool every time, but you consider every tool. And that uh, decision-making process usually entails having chemicals as the, <coughs> the final decision, that after everything else has been considered or tried, you resort to uh, chemical application, and sometimes that's, that's what we have to do. So I pulled three, I'm sorry, two quotes out of Ebeling's Subtropical Fruit Pests, what we call the, um, the bug bible when I was in college. And he made an observation that the, the natural enemies of avocado pests are always, always seem to be under control. And he wrote this in 1959, and that's, that's still a true statement with two exceptions, uh, avocado uh, thrips and perseamite. And then another observation was that border inspections have prevented the introduction of those new, new pests with those two, two uh, previous mentioned introductions. So the border inspections have worked. So we have resident biological controls in the orchard. I started reading, I started writing down everything that's been found, been used um, from an IPM system or, or depended upon. And you've got all these residents out there assuming you don't have anything that upsets the existing balance. Mite controls, scale controls, worm controls, mor Amorbia and Looper are the worms I'm re referring to. So there's a few factors that can affect the, the balance of IPM in avocados. Newly introduced pests, like I'd mentioned, and, and the three listed are, are the three that we're probably most concerned with at this point. Dr. Hoddle's pounded that away at us, and I, I know he's speaking at the uh, annual meeting for the Avocado Society. Resistance is another way to get uh, your IPM out of balance, and that specif specifically refers to the use of abomectin or the overuse, abuse of ab abomectin. We've all been using it um, repeatedly, and this was uh, voiced by uh, Dr. Joe Morris. That was his last concern before he retired was that we are getting tolerance to abomectin from avocado thrips and perseamite. He documented it. The increased use of pyrethroids. We recently had a pyrethroid that was registered for use on avocados. The, the chemistry that is most likely to get resistance quickest are the, are the class of pyrethroids. And so there's a use for them, a need, and it's usually from a convenience standpoint because they have uh, quicker re-entry um, and harvest intervals than they do uh, compared to abomectin. But, but the alternative, or the, uh, the result after spraying pyrethroids, I want to make it clear, these, these materials work so well that you'll end up with a, a sterile orchard. And with that, you'll kill all the pests, but you'll also kill all your beneficials. And, and the pests will always come back quicker <coughs> and in higher number. Cold winter temperatures can kill um, parasites that are regulating populations of Amorbia and Looper, or they can cause the parasites that uh, trigger grandma specifically to, to lay sterile eggs for a while so you don't get control, and the pest gets out of, out of uh, control that, in that way. Dust, pesticide drift, uh, new varieties can upset IPM. Gwens, they drop their leaves quicker than, than any variety there is. I, I, still have a few Gwens, and they, they don't react as they did initially, but uh, they're the, the most susceptible to Perseamite of all the varieties. Whereas Lamhas is one of the more resistant ones. I've never treated Lamhas for Perseamite. 
So another avenue that I was wondering is we've got to manage the diseases to create a he healthy tree. Without the healthy tree, you're going to have more problems. So you want to be aware of the host, the environment, and the pathogen. So your host, the tree, you want to maintain optimum nutrition levels, irrigate when needed, use resistant rootstocks, maintain your soil pH around 6.5. Daryl Nelson at Fruit Growers Lab had, had uh, been a proponent of this he's, and still is. And this allows for greater uptake of nutrition that is required, specifically zinc, nitrogen, and iron. We have more of an issue with this up in Ventura County with heavy clay soils. We don't get good uptake with the high pH soils we've got. You keep your pathogen uh, low, keep the inoculum low, apply woody mulch, apply gypsum, registered for phosphorus acid. I, that's a typo on my part. I was called by, uh, contacted almost immediately by Ben Faber that I had made that mistake. So it's phosphorus acid. Copper boxes for your boots. No entry during wet conditions. A lot of it's common sense. A lot of us, a lot of us are practicing this, and we don't realize, oh, yeah, there was a reason for that. Well, I don't have any more clients that have copper boxes, with the exception of the nurseries. And I asked John Mingy before he retired, uh, the disease expert at UC Riverside, I said, do you, do you really think we need to do copper boxes anymore if, if we assume that avocado root rot is everywhere? And he says, probably not for avocado root rot but there are other diseases out there that we don't have that would be prevented if we did this. So this is something that could be very important in the future. Hopefully we never get another disease. The environment, reduce conditions that favor disease. We plant on the mounds, we leach salts, we don't overwater. So why are healthy trees important? It's, it's obvious. We re resist the attack by Persea mite survive adverse weather conditions, uh, reduce the potential for fruit drop, uh, better fertilized trees, healthier trees withstand diseases, stress trees attract pests. What I consider the three major diseases that we've got in avocados right now, root rot, crown rot, and branch canker, which used to be called Dothiorella, but then we all learned how to spell it, and the scientists changed the name to bot Botrysphyria so that we couldn't spell it again. <laughs> With avocado root rot, new trees, resistant rootstocks, plant on mounds, woody mulch, gypsum, apply registered phosphites, irrigation. It's the common recurring theme. If anybody uh, hasn't seen what active root rot looks like, when you're sampling the root here on the left with the modeling tan and, and alternating uh, light and dark sections. That's an active infected root. And that's, as you're sampling, that's what you want to look for. You don't want to take the, the uh, dead material. Sometimes you'll get low counts. I mentioned mounding and mulching. Weed control is another benefit. So on older trees, we're injecting phosphites into scaffolds. If the root rot's severe, we've, we're trying to rejuvenate that tree. This is radical. This is the last resort. So it, especially if you don't have any trees to replant with, if you're considering taking the orchard out, uh, we have an industry that probably won't have trees if you haven't ordered by now by until the year 2020. So uh, we may be looking more at techniques to rejuvenate our orchard. Apply gypsum, apply mulch. Stump the trees to stimulate re leaf growth so that you can apply, you can apply foliar phosphites. Irrigation. An example of root rot. This is most likely, this is an example of an injection and most likely an unbuffered phosphite. Sometimes it looks worse than what you're trying to cure. A healed over site. And the point of this being is that you've got a wound in the tree and it, it takes about 10 to 14 days to heal. So it's it's an open wound, and it, it needs time to heal. But you're also, you're also causing, um, oops, you're also causing tissue damage when you inject into the trees. So you have to be aware of that. So when you continually inject sites, you need to alternate. And typically, you'll, you'll go around 
the scaffold and, and up higher so that you're not injecting into the same wood every time because of this tissue death. Crown rot prevention, keep the soil and leaves away from the bud union and the graft. Don't allow the irrigation to hit the trunks. If the trunk stays wet for uh, over 24 hours, it can allow entry of the wound, entry of the pathogen into the tree trunk, even without a wound. Prevent wounding when you're suckering, pruning, weed whacking. And you can apply registered phosphites to spread the, slow the spread of disease. So this, this is a common occurrence. It's a no-no. Uh, that trunk can stay wet for a while if, if it's rainy or foggy. On top of that, it, um, this is a great way to uh, reduce the homeless squirrel population. <laughs> so in the background, there's, there, you can see some stump trees there with good leaf flush. And this is, this is what you're trying to do when you stump is create this big leaf flush that allows you to go back to the foliar phosphite therapy for root rot. And you'll, you'll come back into production fairly quick with a large root mass. And so that may be another technique that you can use to fight root rot until you get your new trees. An example of crown rot. Uh, most likely these bud unions are, are buried down here somewhere. So the resistance of the avocado is below the bud union. So if you have soil and leaves piled up, like on a, a slope, uh, you've just compromised your resistance. So after excessive rainfall, whatever that looks like, you want to be careful to move soil away from the uphill side of your trunks. Uh, branch canker, don't prune during wet conditions. Fog, rain, high humidity, cuts are susceptible for 10 to 14 days. If the branches are damaged by sunburn, which many of us have now due to the heat back in July, uh, a, a key fescaline said that uh, we need to prune those before the onset of fall rains. So we have some time, but you also want to do it before the rains come in. Prevent wounding of the trees, picking ladders, forklifts, sunburn. And there are materials, there is a material that you can apply to the wounds. I, I'm not going to mention it because there's still um, debate about it. It looks promising, though. That's what avocado branch, branch canker looks like. So the two major pests of avocados are thrips and perseamite. Avocado thrips was initially found by Charlie Gribble in 1996, June. I believe uh, Joe Barcinas also found it at about the same time, Irvine Ranch. Yeah, well, so we found it like a year before Ventura. Oh. So, yeah, it's in the Irvine Ranch. Okay. Species was new to science, country of origin unknown. Uh, within a year, it had spread north and south quite rapidly, and, and it being in Orange County probably helped that. Significant damage to San Diego County. I don't need to tell you what happened. Uh, if, if you were, were around there and, and you were farming, we had um, a new marketing program called Papacados to the food service industry because of all the scarring on the fruit. Life cycle, what, what's important here is the, um, from 77 degrees uh, they like cooler temperatures. Typically, thrips are more um, sun-oriented and heat-oriented. They, they do better in heat. This thrips kind of likes mild conditions. Efficacy trials were conducted in 98, and I, I was involved in that. They were done down in uh, Temecula, I believe. And um, Steve Pierce was responsible for getting this material pushed through for an emergency use, and he did that five or six years in a row. He saved the industry. We didn't get a full registration for several years. And so through the efforts of Steve Pierce, we were, we were able to continue using this material that helped us. That's what bad looks like. I was going to have a contest, uh, count the thrips, win nothing. <laughs> I think there's 26 on there. So we, we ended up getting more controls for avocado thrips. Still, abamectin is the preferred one because it's cheap. It's, uh, we've got a lot of generic knockoffs. It lasts a long time. It's easy to apply. It's translaminar. You can fly it on top of the leaf, 
strips feed from the bottom even though there's no material there and they, they die from feeding through the leaf. So coverage is important, but not as much. Delegate, same mode of action, translaminar. You need oil. It's a bee hazard, just like abamectin. Danitol, contact material, highest resistance potential, bee hazard. There's label confusion. I was one of the ones that were, was confused. The, the harvest interval is one day, but your pickers have to wear safety equipment for seven days if they're picking. So imagine picking with a Tyvek suit on with laminate gloves. You probably won't have pickers very long. Movento is a new product, relatively new. Systemic, you need to add oil. It's slow to kill thrips. It's expensive in relation to the other materials mentioned, and it's a bee hazard. Everything here is a bee hazard. That's what a papacado looks like. 60%, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was about 60% of the fruit was scarred that year in, in 97 or 98 in San Diego. And, and that's because we only had one material registered for use, and that was Veritran, Sabadella, a stomach poison, which was not um, ideal. Sometimes we treat it up to five or six times per season. And there's nothing like the feeling of uh, four days later having to retreat, having to tell the grower, yeah, it worked, but it only worked four days. Uh, and we were using higher gallonage. You needed to to get good coverage and good control, 75 to 80 gallons per acre was ideal. So your cost of application was higher. Include a uh, feeding attractant. There's sugar in Veritran, but we added more sugar and molasses. We actually had labels for that. A food additive. Better efficacy with heat. Thrip, because it's a stomach poison, the thrips need to be active and move about. So in Ventura, Carpinteria specifically, we get real foggy days. Sometimes it doesn't clear. Not only does the material not, not only does the material not work against thrips, you can't even get it applied because the helicopter pilots won't fly. The ceiling's too low. So now we have uh, Entrust, which works uh, much longer, but you need to add oil and it's a bee hazard. Uh, the benefit of Veritran is it's not a bee hazard. The detriment is it doesn't work very long. This is late season thrip scar. High population of thrips on a, on a larger fruit, but still doing some significant scarring. So culturally, environmentally, what can you do? Uh, Dr. Hoddle had mentioned that, had, had did research that from 77 to 86 degrees, it rise in temperature, 61% of the avocado thrips eggs don't hatch. So if you are growing in an area that is prone to um, higher temperatures, uh, inland areas like Fillmore, Moore Park, uh, Arroyo Grande up north, uh, uh, Temecula down here, the inland avocado growing areas, and you know there's a heat wave coming and you've got a treatment scheduled, usually what we do is delay the treatment until after the, the heat wave goes by to see what the effect is, thereby saving the grower some money and, and still getting some control of thrips. You still have it on the burner, but you hold it back. I'm sorry. Uh, what type of temperatures um, are you looking for in that heat wave? Cause well, if, if you know you're getting above 85 degrees for a length of time and it's not cooling down at night, typically it's hotter than that. We'll, we'll get extremes up into the 90s and 100s and you know that they're getting pummeled. So uh, a couple of days like that, we've got good results. Yeah, And it's, it's a temporary thing because you've still got 40% that still hatch at 86, but it might be enough that it's not causing injury anymore. Or, or significant ear injury. The other thing that heat does is it sizes up the newly set fruit and you get beyond the susceptibility range that much quicker. If you had a six week window where that fruit is susceptible, it might squeeze it down to three weeks and, and then you get out of that window. Also heat drops newly set fruit, usually the smaller fruit first. So sometimes you'll go out there and you'll say, the fruit's not susceptible anymore, it's all too big. And the thrips are lower, so you cancel the treatment. Does that, that help? You, you know this. Mulch, uh, thrips pupate on the ground. They're susceptible to biological activity, predators. And so uh, Dr. Hoddle found that sometimes there's as, as much as a 50% reduction in the thrips populations just from mulch, the activity that's in the mulch. Cover crops can be used to 
uh, maintain and uh, keep a reservoir of beneficial insects like lacewings, hoverflies that feed on the uh, nectaries of certain flowers like alyssum and vetch. The adult lacewings and hoverflies don't, they're not predatory, it's the immature stages that are. So if you keep the adults around, they lay more eggs theoretically and we get um, a, a higher resident population. Lots of predators out there. Some are available commercially, some are just native. There's a beneficial parasitoid also that's out there. It's at very low levels. It doesn't seem to control uh, avocado thrips, but it, it has an impact. Everything collectively can have an impact. I don't know if you can see this. There's a very faint scar. Those were the two contact points of that fruit. That, that was avocado thrips that was causing that injury. I uh, treated this. This is late fall. Um, I didn't want to treat this, but I wanted to maintain the client as a client, if that makes sense. Sometimes you do what you have to do. They wanted perfectly clean fruit. So Persea mite, similar situation. It came in before thrips. First discovered in San Diego County by uh, Matt Hand, my partner. Uh, we didn't get it to Ventura in about 1993. Uh, and further up the coast, it took a little longer. We, in San Luis, Santa Maria, San Luis area, we got Persea mite about the same time we got avocado thrips. Persea mite took longer, thrips was quick and they arrived at the same time. Native to Mexico, damages avocados in arid regions, but it's not a major pest in the, in the large avocado growing areas. Uh, most susceptible varieties, Hass and Gwyn. Oh, uh, um, one thing to note, the, the mite was initially ID'd as Peruviana, a known species, and Dr. McMurtry had noticed something different in the ID of it and realized he had made a mistake and, and then said, this is a previously unidentified or undescribed species. So that helped. It didn't make it any easier, but it helped. The mite damages leaves, feeding on chlorophyll. Leaf drop can occur as, as little as 15% of the leaf surface. I've, I've seen leaves that are way beyond that in terms of uh, damage level and not seeing the leaf drop. So there's more to that, and that has to do with the nutritional levels of the tree, the health of the tree, what else you've got going on, other, other stresses. Do you have root rot? Do you have heavy crop load? That, that all plays a part. Uh, uh, Dave Macklett came up with a new uh, counting technique which helped PCAs do a quicker count method. My partner still uses an older method. He is comfortable with it. I use what we call the Macklett method. Frequent monitoring is important. And as the day length gets shorter and the temperatures theoretically get cooler overnight, uh, right about this time, if you've got a Persea mite infestation, you can, um, what I call playing the game, play the weather game. If we get some cooler temperatures and the mites start slowing down, uh, they don't balloon as much in the, in the air unless you get an east wind condition. Early chemical control, we had sulfur, we had omite, we had narrow range oils. Sulfur was disruptive, so we, we didn't use it. Omite was disruptive, <coughs> and, and the registration was dropped fairly quickly. So what we had left was oil. We applied, um, initially avocados had never been treated. Nobody treats avocados up until Persea mite came in, unless you had greenhouse thrips. So we, we were concerned as an industry of applying oil on trees, on avocado trees that had never had oil. So I, I don't know if you were involved with that, Joe, but we, we tried to defoliate trees with oil. And I believe it was three applications two weeks apart on trees in Corona or Riverside somewhere, but we, we couldn't drop the leaves. So that was a good thing. So then we went to, most of the avocados are planted on hillsides. And so we had to experiment with helicopters and found out that 100 gallons per acre is sort of the the average gallonage you want for contact kill on Persea mite. And you're at the mercy of the helicopter pilot to make sure they go 100 gallons per acre. Well, that, that's pretty slow. That's pretty dangerous in their mind. So it was very difficult. Once you got a good pilot, you, you wanted that same pilot or the equipment. 
It only lasts about a month though. So a very expensive treatment didn't last very long, but it, it sort of got you out of the trouble period, depending on when your perceomite came up. Current chemical control, abomectin, unfortunately, is also the best material, one of the best materials for perceomite. That's not an endorsement. It's, it's nice to have one material that kills the two major pests in avocados. But you should be rotating chemistries at some point. I can't emphasize enough that, that resistance is on the way at some point. I, uh, Anna Howell, who talked at the other two um, sites, mentioned that there is complete resistance to abomectin in Washington State from tetranicid spider mite species. And I, I think the commodity was apples. I'm not certain. So it, it can happen. And it has happened. So they, they can't use this material anymore. We've got Invador, we've got Zeal, we've got Midius. Uh, we still have narrow range oils. Uh, every, everything else is a contact material with the, with the exception of uh, Agrimec or generic knockoffs. Typical perceomite infestation, probably 200 per leaf. Yes, you could get leaf drop with that. Anybody seen this before? <laughs> it was ugly. When, you, when this first came in, it was ugly. So what can you do as a grower, or what, what can you depend upon besides chemicals? I mentioned heat. Um, heat for thrips is a little more dependable. Heat for perceomite is a little touchier. You need extended high temperatures above 90, even 100 degrees for four days with no cooling at night. It's sort of like living in Ventura with no air conditioning. If it's, if it's real hot and you have to break out the fans, that's killing perceomite somewhere else. So you'll get egg collapse. And with that, you'll get a dip in the population for about two weeks, 10 days, two weeks, and then you'll see it slowly come back. You can manage mites with nitrogen, uh, specifically organic growers or growers with young trees that don't want to apply pesticides. You can keep pumping nitrogen to the trees to, to replace lost leaves, sort of mask the effect of persea mite. Reduce your additional tree stress, pick your mature crop, control root rot, Optimum nutrition. You can release predatory mites. Dr. Hoddle did a study, and he proved that uh, beneficial uh, predators, uh, predator mites, could control persea mite. Released at about a 50% presence absence level in the springtime, and it's documented. Uh, he found out it was about 2,000 mites per tree. The cost of those mites was $12 per thousand. That's $24 per tree. That's why we don't do too much of this. It's very expensive. It's more of a, a border type thing where you've got known uh, chronic infestations along dusty roads or you're downwind from your, from your neighbor that's, that's got a lot of dust or wind blowing in mites from his orchard. So it's very expensive to do on a whole orchard. It's great for establishment though. Uh, releasing green lacewings, that has been tried and successfully used. Jim Davis, I'll, I'll let him uh, uh, give more details on that. Preserve your resident beneficial predators, which are out there. Sometimes you don't notice them. That's a good sign, too, because usually that's a sign you have biocontrol. If you have trouble finding things uh, or if you have to look real hard for them, it's a sign that things are in some kind of a balance because they need the pest to survive. So those are the top two, and then I, I went through uh, a list of things that I've had experience with, and I've had experience with every one of these, and people laugh at the bottom one, spiders. If I don't go over, I'll, I'll have a funny story. Omnivorous looper, sporadic pest, uh, multiple generations, you monitor the flights with pheromone traps, uh, field inspect to confirm that, that you know, if you had a flight of 300 moths in one week, does that mean uh, you've got trouble? You need to go out and ground truth it, confirm it. Uh, moths will fly during um, periods when the avocado trees aren't flushing. So you get a flight like that, they're laying eggs, the eggs hatch, the little worms need tender leaf flush to feed on, and, and you get what's, what I, we call in the industry a sui suicidal emergence. So what that says is you don't have to treat. It may not be a good time to release trichogramma either. 
There's no established thres threshold in the literature. It's sort of a by-feel approach. That's what bad looks like. They feed at night, early morning. So how do you predict the looper outbreak? Previous history of the grove, previous malathion use. We used to have outbreaks when we used malathion to control greenhouse thrips back in the, the 80s in Carpinteria. And you would control your avocado thrips and then you'd get a call from the, the uh, field rep for the avocado packing house and he'd say, I got looper all over the place. And it, it, I was called out to a field and you closed your eyes and it sounded like it was raining because the, the um, poop from the worms was so abundant. It sounded like raindrops hitting the leaves. So if I ever lose my eyesight, I can actually <laughs> do, do some, still do some good. They can put me out in the field. High nitrogen levels contribute to uh, looper outbreaks. Unpruned trees, dense canopies, shaded out orchards, cold winters, which, which can kill uh, platin, platineri or lay, cause them to lay sterile eggs. Cool over, overcast springs and summers, because they, they'll feed longer in the daytime. You can go out in the, in the morning and they're just feeding like crazy. Wet winters and springs that cause good leaf flush. Food source. They love the leaves and they'll go to the fruit too. Back then we had not too many chemicals, BTs, which are still available. They have to, have to be applied early, early in the stage of the worm, the, the young worms it's more effective on than the older worms. Cryside, which was a stomach poison, no longer available. Lanate, which uh, if anybody farms cotton, lanate's a widely used material still. Very disruptive, broad spectrum, old chemical, old chemistry. That's what happens when it gets to the fruit. So what can you do now? We, we release trichogramma on occasion when we need to, following cold winters or uh, previous history with the orchard. You have a naturally occurring virus out there that uh, hits looper in high numbers. Still have BTs. Delegate works well if you're treating. Danitol I'd recommend only as a last resort. The adult male moth, what a trap looks like. The, the big, the small parasite with the big name, Trichogramma platinari. Leaf rollers similar, Amorbia, by, we just refer to it as Amorbia. Similar uh, life cycle, feeds on leaves, fruit touching leaves, fruit in clusters. Damage is greater with a heavier crop. Uh, same monitoring. No established threshold. I was uh, looking at Zutanos in Terabella in the 90s, and we had a grower call us, I'm sorry, we were looking at the citrus next door to the Zutanos, and the grower didn't want us to inspect the avocados because he didn't think they were in need of inspection. And he had a, a, a morbia outbreak, and we went out to inspect to confirm. He wanted to know what we should do. We were, always, we were all of a sudden included in his problem. And uh, we were looking in fruit clusters and found uh, probably 20, 20 fruit per every cluster. And, th and there were, this was a heavy crop, and the worms were everywhere. And we found out he had sprayed lanate, and so that most likely caused a disruption. If there was any biological control in there, he just totally messed it up. And then he still had the problem, and there was damage. This is the signature slash on the side of the looper that helps identify it. Amorbia. I'm sorry, Amorbia, thank you. The first meeting we had candies on the table and I told people to throw it if I said something wrong or it's, it's better this way. Although you guys have pens. So predicting Amorbia outbreaks, similar high numbers of fruit, clustered fruit, cold winters, grove history, previous malathion use. Same uh, controls for Amorbia as looper. So I mentioned greenhouse thrips. The longer the fruit is held, the greater the damage. Heavy crop years in the coastal areas had, had very heavy damage. Uh, George Goodall, the extension um, 
agent for Santa Barbara County back in the 80s said greenhouse strips was the key pest. Historically, treatments of malathion I'd mentioned. Repeated applications cause upsets of brown mite, six-spotted mite, looper, Latania scale. So one of the, one of the cultural controls is harving, harvesting your fruit, getting it off the tree. You're eliminating any more damage to the mature crop. And if you do it roughly before August, you're also preventing the thrips from crossing over to your new crop. So you're, that in itself is a control if you do it soon enough. What fruit damage looks like. Strictly cosmetic, there's nothing wrong with that fruit. So packing houses will give you an idea sometimes of what the scar level was. It's a dime size, it's a quarter size, depending on the price of the fruit. Uh, that, that dime size fruit may be worth, may be still marketable as a first grade whereas a quarter may not be. If the price is really high, a dime may knock it down into second, or I'm sorry, may allow quarter to go into first grade. I don't pretend to know how they decide that. We had a wasp that was introduced in 1986 from Australia and also Brazil. Raised first at UC Riverside and then commercially by Foothill Ag Research, uh, Joe Barcenas's operation. And initially, um, had up to 80% control. There should be a word. Yeah, control, that's one of my typos. Some fruit scar occurs before the Thropobius parasite can control the pest. It worked better in the southern areas than the northern areas, which was most likely helped by earlier fruit harvest down here versus up north. Back then, we were, uh, carpenteria growers were holding their fruit into November because they knew that that $2 per pound price was always gonna be there. And so we always had to deal with uh, greenhouse thrips. Abamectin has kept this thing in check. The use of abamectin, unless you're nearby, uh, unless the avocado trees are nearby a house, a power pole, a uh, wind machine, or a school where the helicopter pilots won't fly. That's the adult thrips, the immature stages of the thrips, and these three things which we call, uh, visually they look like mouse pellets. Those are actually parasitized greenhouse thrips parasitized by Thropobius. Brown mite, I mentioned, feeds on the upper leaf surfaces, um, removes chlorophyll, defoliation can occur, normally under good biological control. I, in the literature, I found this, this statement that uh, ap uh, um, avocado brown mite starts to decrease if you've got 40 stethorous beetles per 200 mites. Sometimes we can't wait that long. This beetle is slow to move in. Uh, cultural control includes uh, controlling dust. So I, I had to treat for avocado brown mite this year. The only other time I had treated for brown mite was if a grower had used malathion, which was back in the 80s. And this year I had to treat for it twice. So it, I, I have an idea what caused it. We had, uh, in December, we had tremendous 70 mile an hour winds moving dust around and the two orchards that I had to treat were directly downwind or right next to the path of the Thomas fire. And so there was lots of ash on the tree too. And in those two cases I had uh, the most avocado brown mite I'd seen in a long time. And growers that were uh, in need of treatment. There was no doubt. We kept waiting. We kept, this was January, we're waiting for stethrus. February, we're still waiting for stethrus. We started seeing a couple uh, March, still waiting for stethrus while the weather's warming up. This mite is just going to town. Um, and it, it needed something to knock it back. Narrow range oil, zeal. Um, I'm not sure about abamectin working on this as well. I don't have the experience. Warm temperatures, malathion applications, buildup of dust, ash fires. Jim McMurtry made a statement regarding the avocado brown mite. It's important to use discretion when it comes to any use of insecticides. That's not, that applies for everything, every insect or any pest. False chinch bug. When vegetation dries up or is cut or the weeds are treated, the insect migrates in large numbers and you can look at the ground and it looks like it's moving. That's how many there are. Usually a problem in new plantings 
Healthy trees can withstand the attack. Uh, historically, chemical control was done with malathion. I don't have experience with that. I've only treated chinch bug once back in the 90s up until last week when I had to treat it for the second time. You monitor the borders with the vegetation. It likes spurge. That's a weed you really don't have to treat. It doesn't interfere with irrigation. It's not, you know, it doesn't climb up into the tree. It doesn't uh, attract problems. So there's at least 50 false chinch bug on this leaf here. They mutilated the green tissue on these uh, replants. The leaves are starting to curl up, drop off in some places. There's necrosis to this tree. I, I got the call from the grower and it was when something like something's killing my trees, I need you to come look at this. That, that usually gets you up there real quick. This was in Goleta. A border effect about no more than five trees in from the edge of this, this uh, dried up uh, vegetation. There, there was virtually, there was no spurge in here. I was looking for spurge. There were some weeds that had been treated about three to four weeks prior. But um, the weeds drying out probably triggered it. And just a mass migration. I, I could not believe how bad this was. The, the trees were still getting sucked dry. Earwigs, uh, usually new avocado plantings, they like the tree wraps, they feed at night. Um, if you're not aware of where, the, where they come from, you could see damage and think, well, I've got looper, or I've got full of rose beetle, or I've got snails. You shake the wrap and you've got 50 to 100 earwigs in your tree wrap. Removing the wraps is the best control. There is a bait if, if you need to bait. But if you're removing those wraps, make sure you uh, whitewash the exposed tissue. Brown garden snails, similar, similar issues. They feed at night, remove the wraps. There are uh, registered baits. A torpedo bug, I don't know. Have you ever had torpedo bug down here? You have? Okay. It, it became economic one year. I had a grower tell me, whoops, um, tell me that 10% of his fruit was downgraded because of this insect. Uh, there's more sooty, it creates sooty mold, downgrades the fruit from the, the black sooty mold. Uh, there's a, a biocontrol that's in Carpinteria, the steel blue lady beetle. And so this is the adult. That's the egg mass. There's the immature. And there's your sooty mold. And so in a dry year, if you don't have much rainfall on that, it, it, it gets on the fruit at harvest. It's, uh, I've never treated for it. I think uh, rainfall is the best cure. I'm using the same fruit. The fruit that had the papacado on it also has Latania scale. Latania scale in the 1930s was the number one pest. I, I haven't been able to figure out why. I assume it was we didn't have natural enemies at the time, exposed plantings, more dust, uh, disruptive chemicals. Maybe they were using sulfur. It's under fairly good biological control. Where I've seen it is in uh, border areas, dusty roads where the equipment comes in, the bins are dropped off. In one case, a grower up in Morro Bay uh, had several bins of fruit like this, and the price of avocados was such that uh, he had the, the ability to create a brushing machine and then made his employees hand feed through the three to four bins of fruit to scrape off the, uh, avocado, the uh, Latania scale. And it, it worked fairly well. This is one of the biological controls, twice stab lady beetle. Plifka shot hole borer, it, it's, uh, it's not as bad as advertised. I guess that, that's what I would say. It, it vectors, unless you've got it. I'm sorry, Jim. Um, <laughs> I, I've got it too. I don't mean to. It, it's, it's manageable, I think, is, is what more manageable than we thought it would be. It, it vectors, uh, uh, it spreads the disease, fusarium, it burrows into the branches, it doesn't eat the wood, which is part of the problem with control, causes weakened branches to break. Uh, the control is to cut off the infest infested branch, uh, chip the uh, material into one inch diameter pieces and cover it. Uh, we've, one of the initial places with Hunt, was at Huntington Gardens where this was found, up in San Marino, and those trees were, um, 
not being irrigated or, or fertilized properly. In, since that time, they've had new management and the trees are uh, being properly farmed. They've got a permanent irrigation system. The trees are dark green now. They look nice and healthy. And um, there's, I was there earlier this year. There were maybe two trees that I saw possible feeding by the, the beetle but not like it was back in 2012. And, and the only trees that have died were trees that were uh, killed by gophers. I think there's, there were two trees. There's roughly 30, 34 trees there, I think. This is one of my groves. Got one or two trees that look like this. Branch dies back. You look inside, you see this shotgun type feeding. You see the sugar volcanoes on, on the dead branch. And to confirm, you cut into the uh, bark and you see the, the, the hole that the beetle had dug into. And sometimes you retrieve the beetle. Uh, currently, this was just cut back. We, we chipped it and we're aware of it. We're monitoring the area, but no, we made no chemical treatments, just monitoring. So we had a chemical that was registered for use on 10,000 acres, and I think a grand total of 20 acres was treated the year that was allowed. And so that, that tells me this isn't as bad as advertised. However, it, what we learned from this will allow us to better fight ambrosia beetle if and when we ever get it. Very uh, similar type uh, feeding and damage. It kills avocado trees in Florida. So that we've got some experience. Oh, spiders. Am I there yet? So I had a grower that one day, uh, called me up and said, yeah, I need a wreck to kill the spiders. Pickers wouldn't pick. I mean, it, if you have biocontrol, usually we've got lots of orb weavers. And they get on you, and they sometimes bite. It's no big deal. It's, I, I uh, wanted to keep the client, so I treated the spiders. So ways to improve IPM, or to get there. Use selective materials. Be aware that the materials you're using may have an effect on the beneficials that you're using. Some are effective on the good guys, and some are not. Limit your broad spectrum materials, the pyrethroids. Rotate your chemistries to slow resistance to prevent resurgence. Secondary pest outbreaks like looper. Uh, be aware that cold winters can cause problems. You may have to reintroduce some of your more effective uh, beneficials. Keep the dust down along the roads. Monitor frequently to better time your treatment. Thank you. Host plants, uh, thrips is specific to mostly avocados. Persea mite has a wide host range. When it first came in, we saw it on peaches, all the deciduous trees, it was on roses. Uh, grapes, but didn't seem to be causing too many problems. Initially it did look bad, but um, it's strictly, I'd say, an avocado pest. Both of them. Well, we had some tremendous heat in July, and I'm seeing the result of that in uh, the northern counties. It's, it's still slow to come back. I mean, it, that heat smoked them. It was if there was any good out of that, it was that it, it knocked Persea mite out. And I, I, I told my growers, we're not treating for it this year. There's no, usually I have some marginal groves, and there's, there's nothing, nothing that needs Persea mite treatment. Yes, there's, it, it, you have to uh, maybe dig for it. The Xerces Society may be um, a source. I don't like to promote them. Uh, um, but... Uh, they're aware of a lot of uh, plants that would attract bees and pollinators. Um, and there's, there's literature out there. Organic uh, publications have a lot of uh, uh, vineyards. Grape growers have been doing this for years with um, border plantings, hedgerow plantings, that type of stuff. It's out there. You just kind of dig for it. 